So the plan for this one is we're going to do uh, Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom and a read aloud of Pride and Prejudice.
learn to make your personal bread to improve learning and inspire a peaceful existence. Guided by your obedient servant, Sebastian St. Serapian Smalls, you embark on a journey of self-discovery. But where do we begin? Begin by simply listening, slow down, see just how peaceful today can be. Together, we shall create a harmonious community, bound by shared passions and a desire to elevate the human experience. Sebastian St. Serapian Smalls will be there, to the end of the line, my Valentine, guiding me on this journey towards a more serene and enlightened tomorrow. Catch you guys on the flip side. Alright, so like I was saying, the plan for this one is Pride and Prejudice. Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Um, thanks so much for stopping by. No need to wish us luck because it's a fan of popcorn. Chapter 1 It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. However little known the feelings or views of such a man may be on his first entering a neighborhood, this truth is so well fixed in the minds of the surrounding families that he is considered the rightful property of some one or other of their daughters. My dear Mr. Bennett, said his lady to him one day, have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last? Mr. Bennet replied that he had not. But it is, replied she, for Mrs. Long has just been there, and she told me all about it. Mr. Bennet made no answer. Do you not want to know who has taken it? cried his wife impatiently. You uh, want to tell me, no personal question and I have no objection to hearing it. This was invitation enough. Why, my dear, you must know, Mrs. Long says that Netherfield is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England, that he came down on Monday in a chaise and four to see the place, and was so much delighted with it that he agreed with Mr. Morris immediately that he is to take possession before Michaelmas, and some of his servants are to be in the house by the end of next week. What is his name? Bingley. Is he married or single? Oh, single, my dear, to be sure. A single man of large fortune. Four or five thousand a year. What a fine thing for our girls. How so? How can it affect them? My dear Mr. Bennett, replied his wife. How can it be so tiresome? You must know that I'm thinking of his marrying one of them. Is that his design in settling here? Design? Nonsense! How can you talk so? But it is very likely that he may fall in love with one of them, and therefore you must visit him as soon as he comes. I see no occasion for that. You and the girls may go, or you may send them by themselves, which perhaps would be still better. For as you are as handsome as any of them, Mr. Bingley may like you the best of the party. My dear, you flatter me. I certainly have had my share of beauty, but I do not pretend to be anything extraordinary now. When a woman has five grown-up daughters, she ought to give over thinking of her own beauty. In such cases, a woman has not often much beauty to think of. But my dear, you must go and see Mr. Bingley when he comes into the neighborhood. It is more than I engage for, I assure you. But consider your daughters. Only think what an establishment it would be for one of them. Sir William and Lady Lucas are determined to go, merely on that account, for in general, you know, they, vi they visit no newcomers. Indeed, you must go, for it will be impossible for us to visit him if you do not. You are over-scrupulous, surely. 
I dare say Mr. Bingley will be very glad to see you, and I will send a few lines by you to assure him of my hearty consent to his marrying whichever he chooses of the girls. Though I must throw in a good word for my little Lucy. I desire you will do no such thing. Lizzie is not a bit better than the others, and I am sure she is not half so handsome as Jane, nor half so good-humoured as Lydia. You are always giving her the gift. They have none of them much to recommend them, replied he. They're all silly and ignorant like other girls, but Lizzie has something more of a quickness than her sisters. Mr. Bennet, how can you abuse your own children in such a way? You take delight in vexing me. You have no compassion for my poor nerves. You mistake me, my dear. I have a high respect for your nerves. They are my old friends. I have heard you mention them with consideration these last twenty years at least. Oh, you do not know what I suffer. But I hope you will get over it and live to see many young men of four thousand a year come into the neighborhood. It will be no use to us if twenty such should come, since you will not visit them. Depend upon it, my dear, that when there are twenty, I will visit them all. Mr. Bennet was so odd a mixture of quick parts, sarcastic humor, reserve, and caprice, that the experience of three and twenty years had been insufficient to make his wife understand his character. Her mind was less difficult to develop. She was a woman of mean understanding, little information, and uncertain temper. When she was discontented, she fancied herself nervous. The business of her life was to get her daughters married. Its solace was visiting and Mr. Bennett was among... Ooh, sorry. Wrong continent. Mr. Bennet was among the earliest of those who waited on Mr. Bingley. He had always intended to visit him, though to the last always assuring his, assuring his wife that he should not go. And till the evening after the visit was paid, she had no knowledge of it. It was then disclosed in the following manner. Observing his second daughter employed in trimming a hat, he suddenly addressed her with, I hope Mr. Bingley will like it, Lizzie. We are not in a way to know what Mr. Bingley likes, said her mother resentfully, since we are not to visit. But you forget, Mama, said Elizabeth, that we shall meet him at the assemblies, and that Mrs. Long promised to introduce him. I do not believe Mrs. Long will do any such thing. She has two nieces of her own. She is a selfish, hypocritical woman, and I have no opinion of her. <laughs> no more have I, said Mr. Bennet, and I am glad to find that you do not depend on her serving you. Mrs. Bennet disdained not to make any reply, but a unable to contain herself began scolding one of her daughters. Don't keep coughing so, Kitty, for heaven's sake. Have a little compassion on my nerve. You tear them to pieces. Kitty has no discretion in her coughs, said her father. She times the meal. I do not cough for my own amusement, replied Kitty fretfully. When is your next ball to be, Lizzie? Tomorrow a fortnight. I? So it is, cried her mother. And Mrs. Long does not come back till the day before, so it will be impossible for her to introduce him, for she will not know him herself. Then, my dear, you may have the advantage of your friend and introduce Mr. Bingley to her. Impossible, Mr. Bennet, impossible. When I'm not acquainted with him myself, how can you be so teasing? I honor your circumspection. A fortnight's acquaintance is certainly very little. One cannot know what a man really is by the end of the fortnight. But if we do not venture, somebody else will, and after all, Mrs. Long and her daughters must stand their chance, and therefore, as she will think it an act of kindness, if you decline the office, I will take it on myself. The girls stared at their father. Mrs. Bennet said only nonsense. Nonsense! 
can be the meaning of that emphatic explanation, cried he. Do you consider the forms of introduction and the stress that is laid on me as nonsense? I cannot quite agree with you there. What say you, Mary? What say you, Mary? For you are a young lady of deep reflection, I know, and read great books and make extracts. Mary wished to say something sensible, but knew not how. While Mary is adjusting her ideas, he continued, let us return to Mr. Bingley. I am sick of Mr. Bingley, cried his wife. I am sorry to hear that. But why did you not tell me that before? If I had known as much this morning, I certainly would not have called on him. It is very unlucky. But as I have actually paid the visit, we cannot escape the acquaintance now. The astonishment of the ladies was just worth it. That of Mrs. Bennet, perhaps surpassing the rest, though. Perhaps sur surpassing the rest. Though, when the first tumult of joy was over, she began to declare that it was what she had expected all the while. How good it was in you, my dear Mr. Ben. But I knew I should persuade you at last. I was sure you loved your girls too well to neglect such an acquaintance. Well, how pleased I am. And it is such a good joke, too, that you should have gone this morning and never said a word about it till now. Now, Kitty, you may talk as much as you choose, said Mr. Bennet. And as he spoke, he left the room, fatigued with the raptures of his wife. What an excellent father you have, girls, said she when the door was shut. I do not know how you will ever make him... What? I do not know how you will ever make him amends for his kindness. Or me either, for that matter. At our time of life, it is not so pleasant, I can tell you, to be making new acquaintances every day. But for your sakes, we would do anything. Lydia, my love, though you are the youngest. I guess they have to think of the dogs with you at the next door. Oh, oh, said Lydia stoutly. I am not afraid, for though I am the youngest, I am the tallest. The rest of the evening was spent in conjecturing how soon he would return Mr. Bennett's visit and determining, and, de <laughs> and determining when they should ask him to dinner. Do we want another one or are we done? What do you think? Let me know. Maybe we'll take a break and then I'll do some more things. Thank you guys for being here. Quarantine? Where do I end this thing? All of these subscriptions can really add up. So why not get YouTube Premium? It's like having all of them. And the entire world of YouTube is uninterrupted. For only eleven ninety nine. YouTube Premium. Uh, one month free. Soft focus. I don't know why I'm so soft focused. Yeah. Oh, that's better. <laughs> Hello. My result blurry. Um probably hand sanitizer. Alright, chapter three. Not all that Mrs. Bennett, however with the assistance of her five daughters, could ask on the subject was sufficient to draw from her husband any satisfactory description of Mr. Bingley. They attacked him in various ways, with bare-faced questions, ingenious suppositions, and distant surmises, but he eluded the skill of them all, and they were at last obliged to accept the second-hand intelligence of their neighbor, Lady Lucas. Her report was highly favorable. Miss Sir William had been delighted with him. He was quite young, wonderfully handsome, extremely agreeable, and to crown the whole, he meant to be at the next assembly for the English Nothing could be more delightful. To be fond of dancing was certain step towards falling in love, and very lively hopes of Mr. Bingley's heart were entertained. If I can but see one of my daughters happily settled to marry me, said Mrs. Bennet to her husband, and all the others equally well married, I shall have nothing to wish for. 
In a few days, Mr. Bingley returned Mr. Bennett's visit and sat about ten minutes with him in his library. He had entertained hopes of being admitted to a sight of the young ladies, of whose beauty he had heard much, but he saw only the father. The ladies were somewhat more fortunate, for they had the advantage of ascertaining from an upper window that he wore a blue coat and rode a black horse. An invitation to dinner was soon afterwards dispatched, and already had Mrs. Bennet planned the courses that were to do credit to her housekeeping, when an answer arrived which deferred it all. Mr. Bingley was obliged to be in town the following day, and consequently unable to accept the honour of their invitation, etc. Mrs. Bennet was quite disconcerted. She could not imagine what business he could have in town so soon after his arrival in Hertfordshire, and she began to fear that he might be always flying about from one place to another, and never settled at Netherfield as he ought to be. Lady Lucas quieted her fears a little by starting the idea of his being gone to London only to get a large party for the ball, and a report soon followed that Mr. Bingley was to bring twelve ladies and seven gentlemen with him to the assembly. The girls grieved over such a number of ladies, but were comforted the day before the ball but he, by hearing that instead of twelve, he brought only six women to London, his five sisters and a cousin. And when the party entered the assembly room, it consisted of only five altogether. Mr. Bingley, his two sisters, the husband of the eldest, and another young man. Mr. Bingley was good-looking and gentlemanlike. He had a pleasant countenance and easy, unaffected manners. His sisters were fine women with an air of decided fashion. His brother-in-law, Mr. Hurst, merely looked the gentleman. But his friend, Mr. Darcy, soon drew the attention of the room by his fine, tall person. Handsome features, noble mien, and the report which was in general circulated within five minutes of his entrance of his having ten thousand a year. The gentleman pronounced him to be a fine figure of a man. The ladies declared he was much handsomer than Mr. Bean, and he was looked at with great admiration for about half the evening till his manners gave a disgust which turned the tide of his popularity, for he was discovered to be proud to be above his company, and above being pleased, and not all his large estate in Derbyshire could then save him from having a most forbidding, disagreeable countenance, and being unworthy to be compared with his friend. Mr. Bingley had soon made himself acquainted with all the principal people in the room. He was lively and unreserved, danced every dance, was angry that the ball closed so early and talked of giving one himself at Netherfield. Such amiable qualities must speak for themselves. What a contrast between him and his friend. Mr. Dance, Darcy danced only once with Mrs. Hurst and once with Miss Bingley, declined being introduced to any other lady and spent the rest of the evening in walking about the room, speaking occasionally to one of his own party. His character was decided. He was the proudest, most disagreeable man in the world, and everybody hoped that he would never come there again. Amongst the most violent against him was Mrs. Bennet, whose dislike of his general behaviour was sharpened into particular resentment by his having slighted one of her daughters. Elizabeth Bennet had been obliged by the scarcity of gentlemen to sit down for two dancers, and during part of that time Mr. Darcy had been standing near enough for her to hear a conversation between him and Mr. Bingley, who came from the dance for a few minutes to press his friend to join it. Come, Darcy, said he, I must have you dance. I hate to see you standing about by yourself in this stupid manner. You had much better dance. I certainly shall not. You know how I detest it, unless I am particularly acquainted with my partner. At such an assembly as this, it would be insupportable. Your sisters are engaged, and there is not another woman in the room whom it, whom it would not be a punishment to me to stand up with. I would not be so fastidious as you are, cried Mr. Bingley, for a kingdom. Upon my honour, I never met with so many pleasant girls in my life as I have this evening, and there are several of them who see them. 
You are dancing with the only handsome girl in the room, said Mr. Darcy, looking at the eldest in his head. Oh, she is the most beautiful creature I ever beheld. But there is one of her sisters sitting down just behind you who is very pretty, and I dare say very agreeable. Do let me ask my partner to introduce you. Which do you mean? And turning round, he looked for a moment at Elizabeth. Till catching her eye, he withdrew his own and coldly said, She is tolerable. <laughs> oh, no humour at present to give consequence to young ladies who are slighted by other men. You had better return to your partner and enjoy her smiles. Or you are wasting your time with me. Mr. Bingley followed his advice. Mr. Darcy walked off and Elizabeth remained with no very cordial feelings toward him. She told the story, however, with great spirit among her friends, for she had a lively, place, playful disposition, which delighted in anything ridiculous. The evening altogether passed off pleasantly to the whole family. Mrs. Bennet had seen her eldest daughter much admired by the Netherfield party. Mr. Bingley had danced with her twice, and she had been distinguished by her sisters. Jane was as much gratified by this as her mother could be, though in a quieter way. Elizabeth felt Jane for pleasure. Mary had heard herself mentioned to Miss Bingley as the most accomplished girl in the neighbourhood, and Catherine and Lydia had been fortunate enough never to be without partners, which was all that they had yet learnt to care for before. They returned, therefore, in good spirits to Longbourn, the village where they lived, and of which they were the principal inhabitants. They found Mr. Bennet still up with a book he was regardless of time, and on the present occasion he had a good deal of curiosity as to the event of the evening which had raised such splendid expectations. He had rather hoped that his wife's views on the stranger would be disappointed, but he soon found out that he had a different story to hear. <gasps> oh, my dear Mr. Bennet, as she entered the room, we have had a most delightful evening, a most excellent ball. I wish you had been there. Jane was so admired, nothing could be like it. Everybody said how well she looked, and Mr. Bingley thought her quite beautiful, and danced with her twice. Only oh, think of that, my dear. He actually danced with her twice. And she was the only creature in the room that he asked a second time. First of all, he asked Miss Lucas. He was so vexed to see him stand up. But, however, he did not admire her at all. Indeed, nobody can, you know. And he seemed quite struck with Jane as she was going down the docks. So he inquired who she was and got introduced and asked her for the next, for the two next. Then, the two third he danced with Miss King, and the two fourth with Maria Lucas, and the two fifth with Jane again, and the two sixth with Lizzie, and the Bollinger. Oh, he had had any compassion for me, cried her husband impatiently. He would not have danced half so much. For God's sake, so no more of his partners. Oh, that he had sprained his ankle in the first dance. Oh, my dear, I am quite delighted with him. He is so excessive. And his sisters are charming women. I never in my life saw anything more elegant than their dresses. I dare say the lace. On Mrs. Hurst's gown. <gasps> Here she was interrupted again. Mr. Bennet protested any description of finery. She was therefore obliged to seek another branch of the subject and related with much bitterness of spirit and some exaggeration the shocking rudeness of Mr. Darcy. But I can assure you, she added, that Lizzie does not lose much by his not by not suiting his fancy, for he is a most disagreeable, horrid man, not at all worth pleasing so high and so conceited that there was no enduring him. He walked here, he walked there, fancying himself so very great, but not handsome enough to dance with. I wish you had been there, my dear, to have given him one of your set downs. I quite detest that. <laughs> Chapter 4 When Jane and Elizabeth were alone, the former, who had been cautious in her praise of Mr. Bingley before, expressed to her sister just how very much she admired him. He's just what a young man ought to be, said she. Sensible, good-humoured, lively. And I never saw such happy manners. So much ease, 
with such perfect good breeding. He's also handsome, replied Lister, which a young man ought likewise to be if he possibly can. His character is therefore by, is thereby complete. I was very much flattered by his asking me to dance a second time. I did not expect such a compliment. Did you not? I'm just going to end it for a minute. I'll be back. Sorry about that. Um, mm, uh, I told you I was very much glad that I was asking you to dance this time. I did not expect such a thing. No. Did you not? I did for you. But that is one, that is one great difference between us. Compliments always take you by surprise, and me never. What could be more natural than his asking you again? He could not help seeing that you were about five times as pretty as every other woman in the room. No thanks to his gallantry for that. Well, he certainly is very agreeable. I give you leave to like him. You have liked many a stupider person. There is he. Oh, you are a great deal too apt, you know, to like people in general. You never see a fault in anybody. All the world are good and agreeable in your eyes. I never heard you speak ill of a human being in your life. I would not wish to be hasty in censoring anyone, but I always speak what I think. I know you do, and it is that which, ma it, which is the wonder. With your good sense to be so honestly blind to the follies and nonsense of others, affection of candor is common enough. Affectation of candor is common enough. One meets with it everywhere. But to be candid without ostentation or design, to take the good of everybody's character and make it still better, and say nothing of the bad belongs to you alone. And so you like this man's sisters, too? Mm -hmm. Their manners are not equal to his. Well, certainly not, at first. But they are very pleasing women when you converse with them. Miss Bingley is to live with her brother and keep his house, and I am much mistaken if we shall not find a very charming neighbor in her. Elizabeth listened in silence but was not convinced. Their behavior at the assembly had not been calculated to please in general, and with more quickness of observation and less pliancy of temper than her sister, and with a judgment too unassailed by any attention to herself, she was very little disposed to approve them. They were, in fact, very fine ladies, not deficient in good humor when they were pleased, nor in the power of making themselves agreeable when they chose it, but proud. They were rather handsome, had been educated in one of the first private seminaries in the town, had a fortune of twenty thousand pounds, were in the habit of spending more than they ought, and of associating with people of rank, and were therefore in every respect entitled to think well of themselves and the others. They were of a respectable family in the north of England. A circumstance more deeply impressed on their memories than that their brother's fortune and their own had been acquired by trade. Mr. Bingley inherited property to the amount of nearly £100,000 from his father, who had intended to purchase an estate, but did not live to do it. Mr. Bingley intended it likewise, and sometimes made choice of his county, but as he was now provided with a good house and the liberty of a manor, and it was doubtful to many of those who best knew the easiness of his temper whether he might not spend the remainder of his days at Netherfield and leave the next generation to purchase. His sisters were anxious for his having an estate of his own, but though he was now only established as a tenant, Miss Bingley was by no means unwilling to preside at his table, nor was Mrs. Hurst, who had married a man of more fashionable fortune, less disposed to consider his house as her home when it suited him. Mr. Bingley had not been of age two years when he was tempted by an accidental recommendation to look at Netherfield House. He did look at it, and into it for half an hour, was pleased with the situation in the principal rooms, satisfied with what the owner said in its praise, and took it immediately. Between him and Darcy, there was a very steady friendship, in spite of great opposition. 
Bingley was endeared to Darcy by the easiness, openness, and ductility of his temper, though no disposition could offer a greater contrast to his own, and though with his own he never appeared dissatisfied. On the strength of Darcy's regard, Bingley had the firmest reliance, and of his judgment the highest opinion. In understanding, Darcy was the superior. Bingley was by no means deficient, but Darcy was clever. He was at the same time haughty, reserved, and fastidious, but his ma and his manners, though well-bred, were not inviting. In that respect, his friend had greatly the advantage. Bingley was sure of being liked wherever he appeared. Darcy was continually giving offence. The manner in which they spoke of the Meryton Assembly was sufficiently characteristic. Bingley had never met with more pleasant people or prettier girls in his life. Everybody had been most kind and attentive to him. There had been no formality, no stiffness. He had soon felt acquainted with all the room, and as to Miss Bennet, he could not conceive an angel more powerful. Darcy, on the contrary, had seen a collection of people in whom there was little beauty and no fashion, for whom, for none of whom he had felt the smallest interest, and from none received either attention or pleasure. Miss Bennet, he acknowledged to be pretty, but she smiled too much. Mrs. Hurst and her sister allowed it to be so, but still they admired her and liked her, and pronounced her to be a sweet girl, and one whom they would not object to know more of. Miss Bennet was therefore established as a sweet girl, and their brother felt authorised by such accommodation to think of her as he chose. Chapter 5 Within a short walk of Longford lived a family with whom the Bennets were particularly intimate. Sir William Lucas had been formerly in trade in Meryton, where he had made a tolerable fortune, and risen to the honour of knighthood by an address to the king during his mayor... I this word? Mayoral... During his mayoral... The distinction... The distinction had perhaps been felt too strong. It had given him a disgust to his business and to his residence in a small market town. And in quitting them both, he had removed with his family to a house about a mile from Meryton, denominated from that period Lucas Lodge, where he could think with pleasure of his own importance and, unshackled by business, occupy himself solely in being civil to all the world. For, though elated by his rank, it did not render him supercilious. On the contrary, he was all attention to everybody. By nature, inoffensive, friendly, and obliging, his presentation at St. James's had made him courteous. Lady Lucas was a very good kind of woman, not too clever to be a valuable neighbor to Mrs. Bennett. They had several children. The eldest of them, a sensible, intelligent young woman, about 27, was Elizabeth's intimate friend. That the Miss Lucases and the Miss Bennets should meet to talk over the ball, to talk over a ball, was absolutely necessary. And the morning after the assembly brought the former to Longbourn to hear and to communicate. You began the evening well, Charlotte, said Mrs. Bennet, with civil self-command to Miss Lucas. You were Mr. Bingley's first choice. Yes, but he seemed to like his second better. Oh, you mean Jane, I suppose, because he danced with her twice? To be sure, that did seem as if he admired her. Indeed, I rather believe he did. I heard something about it, but I hardly know what. Something about Mr. Robinson. Perhaps you mean what I heard, overheard between him and Mr. Robinson. Did not I mention it to you? Mr. Robinson's asking him how he liked our Meryton assemblies and whether, he, and whether he did not think there were a great many pretty women in the room and which he thought the prettiest. And his answering immediately to the last question, oh, the eldest Miss Bennet, beyond a doubt. There cannot be two opinions on that point. Upon my word, well, that is very decided indeed. That does seem as if. But, however, it may all come to nothing, you know. My overhearings were more to the purpose than yours, Eliza, said Charlotte. Mr. Darcy is not so well worth listening to as his friend, is he? Poor Eliza. 
to be only just tolerable. But I beg you would not put it into Lizzie's head to be vexed by his ill treatment, for he is such a disagreeable man that it would be quite a misfortune to be liked by him. Mrs. Log told me last night that he sat close to her for half an hour without once opening his lips. Are you quite sure, ma'am? Is not there a little mistake? said Jane. I certainly saw Mr. Darcy speaking to him. I, because she asked him at last how he liked Netherfield, and he could not help answering her. But she said he seemed quite angry at being spoken to her. Miss Bingley told me, said Jane, that he never speaks much unless among his intimate acquaintances. With them he is remarkably agreeable. I would not believe a word of it, my dear. If he had been so very agreeable, he would have talked to Mrs. Long. But I can guess how it was. Everybody says that he is et up with pride. And I dare say he had heard somehow that Mrs. Long does not keep a carriage and had come to the ball in a I do not mind his not talking to Mrs. Long, said Miss Lucas. But I wish he had danced with Eliza. Another time, Lizzie said her mother. I would not dance with him if I were you. I believe Mom. I may safely promise you never to dance with him. His pride, said Miss Lucas, does not offend me so much as pride often does, because there is an excuse for it. One cannot wonder that so very fine a young man with family, fortune, and everything in his favour should think so highly of himself. If I may so express it, he has a right to be proud. That's very true, replied Elizabeth. And I could easily forgive him his pride if he had not mortified mine. Pride, observed Mary, who piqued herself upon the solidity of her reflections, is a very common failing, I believe. By all that I have ever read, I am convinced that it is very common indeed, that human nature is particularly prone to it, and that there are very few of us who do not cherish a feeling of self-complacency on the score of some quality or other, real or imaginary. Vanity and pride are different things, though the words are often used synonymously. A person may be proud without being vain. Pride relates more to an opinion of ourselves, vanity to what we would have others think of. If I were as rich as Mr. Darcy, cried a young Lucas who came with his sisters, I should not care how proud I was. I would keep a pack of foxhounds and drink a bottle of wine a day. Then you would drink a great deal more than you ought, said Mrs. Bennet, and if I were to see you at it, I should take away your bottle directly. The boy protested that she should not. She continued to declare that she would. And the argument ended only with the listener. Chapter 6 The ladies of Longbourn soon waited on those of Netherfield. The visit was soon returned in due form. Miss Bennet's pleasing manners grew on the goodwill of Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley, and though the mother was found to be intolerable and the younger sisters not worth speaking to, a wish of being better acquainted with them was expressed towards the two eldest. By Jane, this attention was received with the greatest pleasure, but Elizabeth still saw superciliousness in their treatment of everybody, hardly excepting even her sister, and could not like them. Though their kindness to Jane, such as it was, had a value as arising in all probability from the influence of their brother's affection. Admiration, brother's admiration. It was evident, it was generally evident whenever they met that he did admire her, and to her it was equally evident that Jane was yielding to the preference which she had begun to entertain for him from, from the first, and was in a way to be very much in love. But she considered with pleasure that it was not directly to be discovered by the world in general, since Jane united with such, with great strength of feeling, a composure of temper and a uniform cheerfulness of manner which would guard her from the super suspicions of the impertinent. She mentioned this to her friend, Miss Lucas. It may perhaps be pleasant, replied Charlotte to be able to impose on the public in such a case, but it is sometimes a disadvantage to be so very guarded. 
If a woman conceals her affection with the same skill from the object of it, she may lose the opportunity of fixing him, and it would then be but poor consolation to believe the world equally in the dark. There is so much of gratitude or vanity in almost every attachment that it is not safe to leave any to itself. We can all begin freely. A slight preference is natural enough. But there are very few of us who have heart enough to really be in, to be really in love without encouragement. In nine cases out of ten, a woman had better show more affection than she feels. Bingley likes your sister undoubtedly, but he may never do more than like her if she does not help him a lot. Help him on. But if she does help him on, as much as her nature will allow, if I can perceive her regard for him, he must be a simpleton indeed not to discover it to him. Remember, Eliza, that he does not know Jane's disposition as you do. But if a woman is partial to a man and does not endeavor to conceal it, he must find it out. Perhaps he must, if he sees enough of her. But though Bingley and Jane meet tolerably often, it is never for many hours together. And as they always see each other in large mixed parties, it is impossible that every moment should be employed in conversing together. Jane should therefore make the most of every half hour in which she can command his attention. When she is secure of him, there will be more leisure for falling in love as much as she chooses. Your plan is a good one, replied Elizabeth where nothing is in question but the desire of being well married. But if I were determined to get a rich husband, or any husband, ah, your plan is a good one, replied Elizabeth. Where nothing is in question but the desire... I will get this right. Your plan is a good one, replied Elizabeth, where nothing is in question but the desire of being well married. And if I were determined to get a rich husband, or any husband, I dare say I should adopt it. But these are not Jane's feelings. She is not acting by design. As yet, she cannot even be certain of the degree of her own regar regard, regard, nor of its reasonableness. She has known him only a fortnight. She danced four, four dances with him at Meryton. She saw him one morning at his own house and has since dined with him in company four times. This is not quite enough to make her understand his character. Well, not as you represent it. Had she merely dined with him, she might only have discovered whether he had a good appetite. But you must remember that four evenings have also been spent together, and four evenings may do a great deal. Yes. Those four evenings have enabled them to ascertain that they both like manner better than commerce. But with respect to any other leading characteristic, I do not imagine that much has been unfolded. Well, said Charlotte, I wish Jane success with all my heart. And if she were married to him tomorrow, I should think she had as good a chance of happiness as if she were to be studying his character for a twelve months. Happiness in marriage is entirely a matter of chance. If the dispositions if the dispositions of the parties were ever so well known to each other or ever so similar beforehand, it does not advance their felicity in the least. They always continue to grow sufficiently unlike our afterwards to have their share of vexation. And it is better to know as little as possible of the defects of the person with whom you are <laughs> with whom you are to pass your life. You make me laugh, Charlotte. But it is not sound, you know it is not sound, and that you would never act in this way yourself. Occupied in observing Mr. Bingley's attentions to her sister, Elizabeth was far from suspecting that she herself was becoming an object of some interest in the eyes of his friend. Mr. Darcy had at first scarcely allowed her to be pretty. He had looked at her without admiration at the ball, and when they next met, he looked at her only to criticize her. But no sooner had he made it clear to himself and his friends that she hardly had a good feature in her face than he began to find it was rendered uncommonly intelligent by the beautiful expression of her dark eyes. To this discovery succeeded some others. 
Though he had detected with a critical eye more than one failure of perfect symmetry in her form, he was forced to acknowledge her figure to be light and pleasing. And in spite of his asserting that her manners were not those of the fashionable world, he was caught by their easy playfulness. Of this, she was perfectly unaware. To her, he was only a man who had made himself agreeable nowhere and who had not thought her handsome enough to dance with. He began to wish to know more. And as a step towards conversing with her himself, attended to her conversation with others. His doing so drew her notice. It was at Sir William Lucas's where a large party was asse were assembled. What does Mr. Darcy mean, said she to Charlotte, by listening to my conversation with Colonel Forrester? That is a question which Mr. Darcy, Darcy only can answer. Well, but if he does it any more, I shall certainly let him know that I see what he is about. He has a very satirical eye. And if I do not begin by being impertinent myself, I shall soon grow afraid of him. On his approaching them soon afterwards, though, without seeming to have any attention of speaking, Miss Lucas defied her friend to mention such a subject to him, which immediately provoked, which immediately provoking Elizabeth to do it, she turned to him and said, Did you not think, Mr. Darcy, that I expressed myself uncommonly well just now when I was teasing Colonel Forster to give us a ball at Meryton? With great energy, but it is always a subject which makes a lady energetic. You are severe on us. What? I don't. Oh, no, I guess it is not a non sequitur. Um, with great energy, but it is always a subject which makes a lady energetic. You are severe on us. It will be her turn soon to be teased, said Miss Lucas. I am going to open the instrument, Eliza, and you know what follows. You are a very strange creature by way of a friend, always wanting to play and sing before anybody and everybody. If my vanity had taken a musical turn, you would have been invaluable. But as it is, I would really rather not sit down before those who must be in the habit of hearing the very best performance. On Miss Lucas's persevering, however, she added, Very well, if it must be so, it must. A gravely, and gravely glancing at Mr. Darcy, there is a fine old saying, which everybody here is, of course, familiar with. Keep your breath to cool your porridge, and I shall keep mine to swell my song. Her performance was pleasing, though by no means capital. After a song or two, and before she could reply to the entreaties of several that she would sing again, she was eagerly succeeded at the instrument by her sister Mary, who, having, in consequence of being the only plain one in the family, worked hard for knowledge and accomplishments, was always impatient for display. Mary had neither genius nor taste, and though vanity had given her application, it had given her likewise a pedantic air and conceited manner which would have injured a higher degree of excellence than she had reached. Elizabeth, easy and unaffected, had been listened to with much more pleasure, though not playing half so well. And Mary, at the end of a long concerto, was glad to purchase praise and gratitude by Scotch and Irish heirs at the request of her younger sisters, who with some of the Lucases and two or three officers joined eagerly in dancing at one end of the room. Mr. Darcy stood near them in silent indignation at such a mode of passing the evening, to the exclusion of all conversation, and was too much engrossed by his thoughts to perceive that Sir William Lucas was his neighbour, till Sir William thus began. What a charming amusement for young people this is, Mr. Darcy. There's nothing like dancing after all. I consider it as one of the first refinements of polished society. Certainly, sir, and it has the advantage also of being in vogue among the less polished societies of the world. Every savage can dance. Sir William only smiled. Your friend performs delightfully, he continued after a pause on seeing Bingley join the group. And I doubt not that you are an adept in the science yourself, Mr. Darcy. You saw me dance at Meryton, I believe, sir. 
Yes, indeed, and received no inconsiderable pleasure from the sight. Do you often dance at St. James's? Never, sir. Do you not think it would be a proper compliment to the place? It is a compliment which I never pay to. It is a compliment which I never pay to any place if I can avoid it. You have a house in town, I conclude. Sir Darcy bowed. I had once had some thought of fixing in town myself, for I am fond of superior society. But I did not feel quite certain about the air of London. I did not feel quite certain that the air of London would agree with Lady Lucas. He paused in hopes of an answer, but his companion was not disposed to make any. And Elizabeth, at that instant moving towards them, he was struck with the action of doing a very gallant thing and called out to her, My dear Miss Eliza, why are you not dancing? Mr. Darcy, you must allow me to present this young lady to you as a very desirable partner. You cannot refuse to dance, I am sure, when so much beauty is before you. And taking her hand, he would have given it to Mr. Darcy, who, though extremely surprised, was not unwilling to receive it, when she instantly drew it, drew back, and said with some discomposure to Sir William, Indeed, sir, I have not the least intention of dancing. I entreat you not to suppose that I moved this way in order to beg for a partner. Mr. Darcy, with grave propriety, requested to be allowed the honour of her hand, but in vain. Elizabeth was determined, nor did Sir William at all shake her purpose by his attempt at persuasion. You excel so much in the dance, Miss Eliza, that it is cruel to deny me the happiness of seeing you. And though this gentleman dislikes the amusement in general, he can have no objection, I am sure, to oblige us for one half hour. Mr. Darcy is all politeness. He is still smiling. He is, indeed. But considering the inducement, my dear and Miss Eliza, we cannot wonder at his complacence. For who would object to such a partner? Elizabeth looked archly and turned away. Her resistance had not injured her with the gentleman, and he was thinking of her with some complacency when thus accosted by Miss Bingley. I can guess the subject of your reverie. I should imagine not. You are considering how insupportable it would be to pass many evenings in this manner? in such society, and indeed I am quite of your opinion, I was never more annoyed. The insipidity, and yet the noise, the nothingness, and yet the self-importance of all those people. What would I give to hear your strictures on them? Your conjecture is totally wrong, I assure you. My mind was more agreeably engaged. I have been meditating on the very great pleasure which a pair of fine eyes in the face of a pretty woman can just bestow. Miss Bingley immediately fixed her eyes on his face and desired he would tell her what lady had the credit of inspiring such reflections. Mr. Darcy replied with great intrepidity, Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Miss Elizabeth Bennet, replied Miss Bingley. I am all astonishment. How long has she been such a favourite? And pray, when am I to wish you joy? That is exactly the question which I expected you to ask. A lady's imagination is very rapid. It jumps from admiration to love, from love to matrimony in a moment. I knew you would be wishing me joy. Nay, if you are serious about it, I shall consider the matter is absolutely settled. You will be having a charming mother-in-law, indeed. And of course, she will always be at Pemberton. He listened to her with perfect indifference while she chose to entertain, his, to entertain herself in this manner. And as his composure convinced her that all was safe, her wit flowed long. Hope you guys have a great day. There was good humour and kindness. Mr. Darcy said very little, and Mr. Hurst nothing at all. The former was divided between admiration of the brilliance which exercise had given to her complexion and doubt as to the occasions justifying her coming so far alone. The latter 
just thinking only of his breakfast. Her inquiries after her sister were not very favorably answered. Miss Bennet had slept ill, and though up, was very feverish and not well enough to leave her room. Elizabeth was glad to be taken to her immediately, and Jane, who had only been withheld by the fear of giving alarm or inconvenience from expressing in her note how much she longed for a visit, was delighted at her entrance. She was not equal, however, to much conversation, and when Miss Bingley left them together, could attempt little besides expressions of gratitude for the extraordinary kindness she was treated with. Elizabeth silently attended her. When breakfast was over, they were joined by the sisters, and Elizabeth began to like them herself when she saw how much affection and solicitude they showed for Jane. The apothecary came, and having examined his patient, said, as might be supposed, that she had caught a violent cold and that they must endeavor to get the better of it, advised her to return to bed and promised her some draughts. The advice was followed readily, for the feverish symptoms increased and her head ached. Elizabeth did not quit her room for a moment, nor were the other ladies often absent. The gentlemen being out, they had, in fact, nothing to do elsewhere. When the clock struck three, Elizabeth felt that she must go, and very unwillingly said so. Miss Bingley offered her the carriage, and she only wanted a little pressing to accept it, when Jane testified such concern in parting with her that Miss Bingley was obliged to convert the offer of the chaise to an invitation to remain at Netherfield for the present. Elizabeth most thankfully consented, and a servant was dispatched to Longbourn to acquaint the family with her stay and bring back a supply of clothes. I think I have a little more battery. Chapter 8. Chapter 8. At five o'clock, the two ladies retired to dress, and at half past six, Elizabeth was summoned to dinner. To the civil inquiries which then poured in, and amongst which she had the pleasure of distinguishing the much superior solicitude of Mr. Bingley's, she could not make a very favorable answer. Jane was by no means better. The sisters, on hearing this, repeated three or four times how much they were grieved, how shocking it was to have a bad cold, and how excessively they disliked being ill themselves, and then thought no more of the matter, and their indifference towards Jane, when not immediately before them, restored Elizabeth to the enjoyment of all her former dislike. Their brother, indeed, was the only one of the party whom she could regard with any complacency. His anxiety for Jane was evident, and his attentions to herself most pleasing, and they prevented her feeling herself so much an intruder as she believed she was considered by the others. She had very little notice from any but him. Miss Bingley was engrossed by Mr. Darcy, her sister, scarcely less so. And as for Mr. Hurst, by whom Elizabeth sat, he was an indolent man who lived only to eat, drink, and play at cards, who, when he found her to prefer a plain dish to a, now I don't know this word, ragout, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I know what it, I know what it is. I know how to spell it. I know how to read it. I don't know how to pronounce it. So you know what I mean. A ragout. <laughs> I had nothing to say to her. When dinner was over, she returned directly to Jane, and Miss Bingley began abusing her as soon as she was out of the room. Her manners were pronounced to be very bad indeed. She didn't know how to say rag out, clearly. A mixture of pride and impertinence. She had no conversation, no style, no beauty. Mrs. Hurst thought the same and added, she has nothing in short to recommend her but being an excellent walker. I shall never forget her appearance this morning. She really looked almost wild. 
She did indeed, Louisa. I could hardly keep my countenance. Very nonsensical to come at all. Why must she be scampering about the country because her sister had a cold? Her hair so untidy, so blousy. Yes, and her petticoat. I hope you saw her petticoat six inches deep in mud, I am absolutely certain. And the gown, which had been let down to hide it, not doing its office. Your picture may be very exact, Louisa, said Bingley. But this was all lost upon me. I thought Miss Elizabeth Bennet looked remarkably well when she came into the room this morning. Her dirty petticoat quite escaped my notice. You observed it, Mr. Darcy, I am sure, said Miss Bingley, and I am inclined to think that you would not wish to see your sister make such an exhibition. Certainly not. Yeah. To walk three miles or four miles. Now, who is this talking? Yes. To walk three miles or four miles or five miles or whatever it is, above her ankles in dirt and alone, quite alone. What could she mean by it? It seems to me to show an abominable sort of conceited independence and most country town indifference to decorum. It shows an affection for her sister that is very pleasing, said Mr. Bingley. I am afraid, Mr. Darcy, observed Miss Bingley in a half whisper, that this adventure has rather affected your admiration of her fine eyes. Not at all, he replied. They were brightened by the exercise. A short pause followed this speech, and Mrs. Hurst began again. I have an excessive regard for Miss Jane Bennet. She is really a very sweet girl, and I wish with all my heart she were well settled. But with such a father and mother and such low connections, I'm afraid there's no chance of it. I think I have heard you say that their uncle is an attorney in Meryton. Yes, and they have another who lives somewhere near Cheapside. That is capital, added her sister, and they both laughed heartily. If they had uncles enough to fill all Cheapside, cried Bingley, it would not make them one jot less agreeable. But it must very materially lessen their chance of marrying men of any consideration in the world, replied, Miss, replied Darcy. To this speech, Bingley made no answer. But his sisters gave their hearty assent and indulged their mirth for some time at the expense of their dear friend's vulgar relations. With a renewal of tenderness, however, they returned. <laughs> They're so awful, this is he. With a renewal of tenderness, however, they returned to her room on leaving the dining parlour and sat with her till summoned to coffee. She was still very poorly, and Elizabeth did not quit her at all late in the evening when she had the comfort of seeing her sleep and when it seemed to her rather right than pleasant that she should go downstairs herself on entering the drawing room she found the whole party at loo and was immediately invited to join them but suspecting them of be uh, suspecting them to be playing high she declined it and making her sister the excuse said she would amuse herself for the short time she could stay below with a book Mr. Mr. Hurst looked at her with astonishment. Do you prefer reading to cards? Said he. That is rather singular. Miss Eliza Bennet, said Miss Bingley, despises cards. She is a great reader and has no pleasure in anything else. I deserve neither such praise nor such censure, cried Elizabeth. I am not a great reader, and I have pleasure in many things. In nursing your sister, I am sure you have pleasure, said Bingley, and I hope it will be soon increased by seeing her quite well. Elizabeth thanked him from her heart, and then walked towards the table where a few books were lying. He immediately offered to fetch her others, but fetch her others, all that his library afforded. And I wish my collection were larger for your benefit and my own credit, but I am not able. And though I have not many, I have more than I have ever looked into. Elizabeth assured him that she could suit herself perfectly with those in the room. 
I am astonished, said Miss Bingley, that my father should have left so small a collection of books. What a delightful library you have at Pemberley, Mr. Darcy. It ought to be good, he replied. It has been the work of many generations. And then you have added so much to it yourself. You're always buying books. I cannot comprehend the neglect of a family library in such days as these. Neglect? I'm sure you could neglect nothing that can add to the beauties of that noble place. Charles, when you build your house, I wish it may be half as delightful as Pemberley. I wish it may. But I would really advise you to make your purchase in that neighbourhood and take Pemberley for a kind of model. There is not a finer country, county in England than Derbyshire. With all my heart, I will buy Pemberley itself if Darcy will sell it. I am talking of possibilities, Charles. Upon my word, Caroline, I should think it more possible to get Pemberley by purchase than by imitation. Elizabeth was so much caught with what passed as to leave her very little attention for her book. And soon, laying it wholly aside, she drew near the card table and stationed herself between Mr. Bingley and his elder, eldest sister to observe the game. Is Miss Darcy much grown since the spring, said Miss Bingley? Will she be as tall as I am? I think she will. She is now about of Miss Elizabeth Bennet's height, or rather tall. How I long to see her again. I never met with anybody who delighted me so much. Such a countenance, such manners, and so extremely accomplished for her age. Her performance on the pianoforte. Begin by simply listening, slow down, see just how peaceful today can be. Um, Thanks so much for swinging by and catch you guys on the flip side. It is exquisite or exquisite. I can never remember which is American and which is English. One of them. It is exquisitely exquisite. It is amazing to me, said Bingley, how young ladies can have patience to be. <laughs> It is amazing to me, said Bingley, how young ladies can have patience to be so very accomplished as they all are. All young ladies accomplished? My dear Charles, what do you mean? Yes, all of them, I think. They all paint tables, cover screens, and net purses. I scarcely know anyone who cannot do all this. And I'm sure I never heard of a young I never heard a young lady spoken of for the first time without being informed that she was very accomplished. Your list of the common extent of accomplishments, said Darcy, has too much truth. The word is applied to many a woman who deserves it no otherwise than by netting a purse or covering a screen. But I am very far from agreeing with you in your estimation of ladies in general. I cannot boast of knowing more than half a dozen in the whole range of my acquaintance that are really accomplished. Nor I, I am sure, said Miss Bingley. Then, observed Elizabeth, you must comprehend a great deal in your idea of an accomplished woman. Yes, I do comprehend a great deal in it. Oh, certainly, cried his faithful assistant. No one can be really esteemed accomplished with who does not greatly surpass what is usually met with. A woman must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, and the modern languages to deserve the word. word. And besides all this, she must possess a certain something in her air and manner of walking, the tone of her voice, her address and expressions, or the word will be but half deserved. All this she must possess, added Darcy. And to all this she must yet add something more substantial in the improvement of her mind by extensive reading. I'm no longer surprised by your knowing only six of my children. I rather wonder now at you knowing any. Are you so severe upon your sex, upon your own sex, as to doubt the possibility of all this? I never saw such a woman. I never saw such capacity and taste and application and elegance as you describe united. 
Mrs. Hurst and Mrs. Bingley both cried out against the injustice of her implied doubt, and were both protesting that they knew many women who answered this description, when Mr. Hurst called them to order with bitter complaints of their, of their inattention to what was going forward. As all conversation was thereby at an end, Elizabeth soon afterwards left the room. Elizabeth Bell, said Miss Bingley when the door was closed on her, is one of those young ladies who seek to recommend themselves to the other sex by undervaluing them. She was not so unwilling to comply with their brother's proposal. She was not so unwilling to comply with their brother's proposal, and it was settled that Mr. Jones should be sent for early in the morning if Miss Bennet were not decidedly better. Bingley was quite uncomfortable. His sisters declared that they were miserable. They solaced their wretchedness, however, by duets after supper, while he could find no better. Than by giving his housekeeper directions that every attention might be paid to the sick lady. Elizabeth passed the chief of the night in her sister's room, and in the morning had the pleasure of being able to send a tolerable answer to the inquiries after which she very early received from Mr. Bingley, Bingley by her housemaid, and some time afterwards from the two elegant ladies who waited on her sister. In spite of his amendment, however, she requested to have a note sent to Longbourn, desiring her mother to visit Jane. She would not listen, therefore, to her daughter's proposal of being carried home. Neither did the apothecary, who arrived about the same time, think it at all advisable. After sitting a little while with Jane on Miss Bingley's appearance and invitation, the mother and three daughters all attended her into the breakfast parlour. Mr. Bingley met them with hopes that Mrs. Bennet had not found Miss Bennet worse than she expected. Indeed, I have, sir, was her answer.